The GBA has had many different mod kits over the years, most of which are honestly pretty great, but there's just something about this darn V2 kit that keeps me coming back to it. I like it so much that I'm making another in-depth tutorial for it, but also because the first one I did was two years ago and it's not a good video. I've quite literally done this mod hundreds of times since then, and I've learned a lot of tips and tricks along the way. So today, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know and more about how to mod your old Game Boy Advance to look like this. By the time you're done watching this video, you'll be able to kick this mod's butt even if you've never touched a soldering iron. And before you click away, it doesn't require soldering. You just won't be able to adjust the brightness. But I promise I will make it seem way less scary. I swear you can do this. At least give me the chance to show you how easy it is. Who knows, you might like it and start fixing things around the house. So let me give you the list of tools you'll need to mod this. You'll obviously need a GBA and an IPS mod kit. And while this tutorial is specific to the IPS V2 kit that I'll have linked in the description, there is a ton of general GBA modding knowledge that you can learn from in this video, especially if you are a beginner. However, I already have dedicated tutorials for all the other different IPS kits, as well as an in-depth comparison video to help you decide which kit will best fit your playstyle. If you want to go with the V2, great. You'll probably also want to buy a shell though. Now this part is unfortunately extremely confusing for no good reason. You can use the original shell if you don't mind trimming the plastic back quite a bit. I don't really recommend that though. And IPS ready really doesn't mean anything anymore since there are so many different IPS kits. So I have an entire video dedicated to helping you find which shells work with which screens. I know I'm pushing you to other videos, but I'm sorry. I'm trying my best here. This video is already really long, but I will also link to a couple options that will be pre-trimmed for this kit specifically. But going back to the tools, the only thing that you absolutely need is a Phillips and Tri-Wing screwdriver. Now, depending on who you ask, some people will get their panties in a twist over it technically being JIS and Tri-Point screws. Now, Tri-Wing is actually something different from the Tri-Point or Y bits, and I've heard all the different names thrown around for these screws, but at the end of the day, I've always used a Phillips one bit and a Y0 bit from my iFixit kit, and it works just fine. It really doesn't matter as long as you're careful and as long as the bits fit in the screws. Which, lucky for you, your kit should come with the correct screwdrivers for the job. They won't be very high quality, but if you're careful, you'll be fine. This isn't a speed run. I'm the only one who's dumb enough to do that. 7 minutes, 25 seconds, by the way. Other than those two screwdrivers, the rest of the tools are completely optional. Since I recommend soldering, you will need a soldering iron and solder for that. But again, you don't have to. And if you do solder, I highly recommend Flux. It will make soldering so much easier. Even if you don't solder, I highly recommend having some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush, Q-tip, or paper towel to clean up your motherboard. Since we're going to be in here anyway, you might as well make those buttons shiny and clean up your cart slot to prolong your Game Boy's life. 70% is fine, but the higher the percent, the better. Either way, just make sure it's dry before you close it back up. And honestly, it should dry by the time we're done with this mod anyway. If you really want to prolong your Game Boy's life, I recommend cleaning the power switch. I'm not going to go over that in this video, but I'll link to my short on how to do it down below. I will also have all of those tools linked down below, as well as a soldering starter kit that is only $20. It's the one that I personally got my start with, and it comes with a lot of the tools I mentioned, plus even more. Another optional tool is a mod mat. It's a nice to have if you plan on working on more than just this mod, but as long as you solderers aren't working on or near a flammable surface, I think you'll be fine. And flush cutters. I forgot. It's kind of necessary, kind of not. Depends on the shell you get. Again, there will be a million links in the description, and you might be able to use code Jake to save some money. It depends on the website, but it doesn't hurt to try it everywhere. The last thing I'll mention before we get started is I have an even more overly in-depth extended cut of this tutorial on the second channel, Jake64. So if you're still a little nervous about all of this, I'll hold your hand a little more over there. But this video right here will have everything you need to know, even if this is your first time seeing a soldering iron. So let's get started. There are six tri-wing screws on the Game Boy Advance. And now we can flip over to our Phillips head. Again, JIS, doesn't really matter, just be careful. And we're gonna be taking out this screw right here. It is usually black. Now, I'm not gonna be reusing the screws. 
The only time I really reuse screws is if I'm doing an SP mod, because those are better screws than the originals, but the aftermarket screws are pretty good for most other mods. Really depends on the quality of the shell, but the one I'm using today is good, so I'm just leaving all the screws in their spots. That way I don't have to deal with them. But we can put that back half off to the side for now. And in here, I actually do have three Phillips screws. Not all of them will have all three Phillips screws in there. I don't know why they did that, but usually you'll only see two in here. This one's pretty much always there, but one of these two might be missing for you. It's fine, it's okay. The replacement screws have three for the motherboard. But before we get there, we're gonna take our thumbs like this, put our fingernails underneath the latch and push up. If we push up at the same time, both sides should go up and we won't have a teeter-totter going on. Then we can stick our tweezers in there and pull up. Careful not to puncture your ribbon cable with the pointy tweezers. You can also use your screwdriver if you don't have any tweezers. Anything small, just make sure if it's not coming out, don't force it out. You probably just don't have the latch up enough. And from there, we can take these three Phillips screws out. They're the same size as the black screw. If you want to organize them off to the side, you can, but it's not really necessary because we have the other screws in our new kit. If you're reusing the screws, then you should probably organize them, but all three of these are the same. It shouldn't matter if you mix them up. From here, I like to grab it by the cart slot and just pull up. Some of the buttons might fall off. Some of the membranes might stick to the board. It's all good. We can put this off to the side and remove the membranes if they're stuck to it. But with everything else off to the side, we can look at the motherboard and scanning around. Oh, there's actually some corrosion over here. I How did I miss that before? Well, that's perfect because I was about to say, do anything that you need to to fix your Game Boy now. If it's dirty, I recommend spraying some isopropyl alcohol on it, using your toothbrush to lightly clean everything up. At the very least, I highly recommend cleaning up the gold pads for all of your buttons. That way you'll have better accuracy when you actually press your buttons. But I'm gonna do a time lapse of me swapping this out real quick. It shouldn't take very long. It's not necessary for this video. Now that our Game Boy Advance is fully cleaned, fixed, and ready to go, we can get to the modding portion, which will actually include me putting that off to the side and getting out our mod kit. Now's the time to take everything out of its plastic bags. Maybe I should have put scissors as a requirement for this. This particular lens that was included is not cut for the IPS V2. I believe this is cut for an original display or a drop-in display, so we're ignoring that one. Here are the rest of our buttons. Some of them are already included or installed, I should say. And then the rest of our membranes. And then I'm just gonna dump the screws and the light pipe right there. We have all of our stuff unpacked so we can go over it. You should have at least three wires. Most GBA kits will come with these three wires, one for L, one for R, and one for select. You should also get these things. This is for if you trim your IPS kit, but we're actually gonna use these because I like these. Well, at least the thinner one we're gonna use. You've got your ribbon cable. This is the most important and most expensive part of this entire kit. Do not hurt this thing. Here is our screen that we will connect this to later. The insulating film, the foam, and the double-sided tape that we'll use in just a bit. I'm gonna put most of this off to the side. We can go ahead and install this real quick because you can really do this at any point. But I'm going to try and line it up in the corner where the connector is. It doesn't need to be perfect but I don't like it to stick out too much. It can kind of get in the way when we're putting it in the shell. And we're not going to connect this immediately. We're gonna do the soldering first. If you don't wanna do the soldering, that's okay. But at least watch the soldering portion to see how easy it really is. Then you can make your decision because honestly, I believe in you. I think you can do it. We are going to put this off to the side and we're going to leave this out. And I'm specifically placing it down like this with the connector part over here, and all of our writing is upside down. We can now get our soldering irons out. I'm plugging mine in, and I'm gonna turn it to 300 degrees Celsius. We are going to put the soldering iron on the L pad, on the gold part, and when we do this, I'm gonna only hold it there for like a second before we start pushing the solder in, and then we lift up. It's that fast, it's that simple, it's that easy. Now, 
if you do not want to use Flux, if you do not want to buy it because this is the only project you're going to do with soldering, you're done after this, I get it. It's fine. You're probably going to want to clean your irons tip after every time you add solder. So I'll do that with you. If you have a sponge, wet it and wipe it off until it's nice and clean. Get all the excess solder off. Then we're going to do that again to the R pad. We're going to place it down. We're going to stick the solder in and then we're going to lift up. That was not as clean of a go. So we can put it down, lift it up. Not that great. We didn't put too much solder on here. So we can stick the iron back down, push a little bit more in and lift up. It's a little cleaner. Either way, it's fine. You don't want too much on your iron or on the pad because when we go to do the last one, we don't want any bridging to occur. So again, cleaning it up and then we do the same process again. Stick it down, stick it in and lift up. We got two out of three perfect solder balls there. Nothing's bridging. Everything's good. Now, yes. Cleaning the tip after every single attempt is overkill. That's why I like flux. That way, if you do add too much solder, or if you're accidentally bridging something somehow, you can take your flux, and we're gonna clean up the R pad here. Even though it's not necessary, it's totally fine. That's perfectly acceptable. We can just touch it down, and flux is gonna make it perfect. Like we can try and bridge those. Flux is gonna keep that from doing anything. Now I would recommend wiping your tip clean because you probably have a little too much solder on your tip. But it's also fine if you do leave a little bit on here because our next step is adding the wires. So we've got L, R, and select. And L is for the left button, right? So we're gonna stick the wire out to the left. No, this is upside down. So I'm gonna stick the wire out to the right side and we're gonna solder this to the L pad here. Beautiful. The next wire is for R, so we're gonna stick that out to the left and solder that down to R. And then we're gonna take select and stick that out to the left as well. You'll see why in a bit, and solder that down as well. When I say solder that down, all I'm doing is touching the tip to the part I want to connect the wire to. All of these look decent. There's no bridging occurring. Everything looks pretty good. They're connected, and if you give it the pull test and they're not coming off, don't yank them, but just a light, light pull. Make sure they're connected and they stay you're good. Do not pull too hard. That would be very bad. But I'm going to unplug my soldering iron for now, and we'll get back to the soldering in a little bit. We're going to need to snip this piece right here. This is here for a drop-in display, so it's all even without needing any extra stuff done to it. But we're going to flush cut this piece right here for our V2 kit. That's it. You could also use a craft knife if you need to, but it's going to be easier with flush cutters. But I feel like most people have some sort of razor blade in their home and that'll work just fine. I am also going to cut the one on the other side too because this isn't always the most accurate because shells are weird. The bottom side, that one's fine. We don't need to mess with it, but you can cut it if you want to. If your shell has three notches on the left side and no notch on the right side, you don't have to do anything. If there's a notch on the right side and you're using the V2 kit, you need to cut everything off the right side. Cool. We are going to take our double-sided tape and we're going to peel the yellow side first or whatever side has the cutouts on the left. I guess it'll be right over here because we want these cutouts, even though we just flush cut away at one of our cutouts, we are going to drop that down on that side and make sure it's close to the top as well and stick that down everywhere we can. Run your finger along it just to make sure it's stuck down. And then we can punch it through the other side and we don't need this. Now we can take our tweezers or your fingernail. Mine aren't really that long, so I'm using the tweezers. We can peel up the rest. And the reason why we cut that one off is because I like to use the guide that's included. This makes it easier because instead of one tiny little point, it's going to give us a full guide on that left side. So hopefully it won't be twisted when we install it. So I'm going to stick it with either of the uh, brown sides up all the way up against the top there and all the way up against the left side and stick that down. You don't need to peel the brown pieces because you're not gonna see it. That's all we need to do for now. If you were using an original shell, you would do the same thing, putting that there, and then the, this would go in the bottom piece. I don't think anybody's actually trimming and following along with this. So we're gonna put that shell off to the side for now. We're gonna get our screen back out 
and orient it this way. We can stick the ribbon cable down like this. And we're gonna connect the two finally. This is really hard to capture because it's so small, but I'm trying my best here. We're gonna take the connector and fold it over and it fits in just like a puzzle piece. Some might even call it a Lego connector. I don't know if that's the actual term or not. Shout out to my Mavens. But make sure it's nice and locked in there. Don't put too much pressure, but obviously you want that locked in. Then from here, I like to get the screen lens out. We can peel the outer part. Then I like to try and peel just the tape part and the first layer. And then we just have this loose piece and it's really loose for us here, which is good. But if it's not easily coming out like mine just did, using your thumbs to do a pinching motion will bring this up like so. And then it'll be easy to touch without getting your grubby little fingerprints on the glass. And we'll carefully grab it from the other sides. If you have some canned air and you're like really worried about dust, you can spray that. But for this part, we don't really need to worry about dust because we'll be getting in and out of it for a couple more minutes. And it should just line up with your shell. There might be a little bit of gaps. Don't worry too much about it. Mine looks fairly good. I am out of canned air, unfortunately, so hopefully we won't get too much dust in here. We're gonna act quickly so we don't get too much dust in here. You can take the green little tab, peel that back, and then we can take it, still grabbing it by the sides, put it in the top left corner, up against our guide as far left and as far up as possible and drop that down. It should be pretty close along that right side and we can lightly press everything down just a bit. Oh, and that sucks. Unfortunately, the select plastic got in the way and so our ribbon cable came out. This is why we install it first because it's really hard to connect this connector, connect the connector when the screen is stuck down in the shell. So I'm gonna try and attempt that again. That didn't have a good click like the first time. So this might just be a black screen when we turn it on, but you don't always need a perfect click when you connect that connector. Either way, we are connected and hopefully fingerprintless on the screen, hopefully dustless as well, but don't get your hopes up. From here, we can put the whole assembly down here and we can get our motherboard back out. And I like to place it down like this. We're gonna solder the select wire right now. So getting our soldering irons back out. Once again, we will put the tip on the spot we're gonna solder to, push the solder in and then lift up. I forgot to mention that we're soldering to TP2. There won't be as much solder that sticks to this spot. It's a little smaller. You'll only see a little bit of solder, but that's plenty. We can take our select wire and make sure it's the select wire. Hold it up over there, press our soldering iron down, and we should be good. Now here's where you wanna be careful and look at your soldering job once you're done. Everything looks good over here. I did accidentally add a little bit of solder to this via right here. That's totally fine. As long as your wire isn't extending to any of these other points anywhere around TP2, you're good. It's very common for the wire to get extended past the TP2 spot. And so you might accidentally bridge either of these two points, maybe the capacitor or the resistor, and that will cause your button to either not work, always be pressed down, make start press when selects press, all of that stuff. Essentially what I'm trying to say is it's not good, but it's not the end of the world. You can fix it, it's fine. That's where flux can come in handy, putting some flux down, reflowing the solder, and just make sure the wire is only touching TP2. It's like the most common thing I see with modding and beginners. It's something that happens to me on a regular basis when I'm not careful. I mean, it doesn't happen to me like every day, but it still happens to me. Accidents happen, it's okay. And as long as you aren't holding your soldering iron down for too long, you're not gonna have any burnt pads, you can easily just rip off those gold pads. You don't need to hold it for more than like two or three seconds. So if something's not going right, if the solder isn't adhering right, or there's something going wrong, just lift it up every few seconds. Don't get it too hot. Don't force anything. It should be easy. So if it's not easy, you might be doing something wrong. Just take a second, step back, then get back to it. And Flux is always your friend. But as long as your wire is all good, 
we can do a little tiny pull test. See, I'm barely pulling on that. I'm not yanking it. Just a little pull. It's not going anywhere. We're good. From here, some people like to solder to the test pads for L and R. I don't like to do that. Especially for R, there's a lot of stuff in this area that can cause it to short to ground. That's not good. Because if you short this wire to ground, it's connected to R, so then R will always be pressed down. And normally what happens when you solder to the test pad for R is it either gets stuck in the hole over here and it gets pinched, it gets pinched on one of these components. It's just not fun. It's a lot easier to do it my way, so I'll show you that in a minute. L is a different story. So if you really want to do all your soldering here, you would need to solder to TP9 for L and TP8 for R. But from here, we can go ahead and put all of our buttons in. D-pad, A on the outside, B on the inside. They only go in one way. You can put your start and select membrane in there. There are no hard plastic buttons for that. We can put our D-pad membrane down. It only goes in one way. And this also only goes in one way for the A and B buttons. Now, there is some leftover plastic here. I just like to put the power switch the side posts, which this part that sticks out is on our right side right now. And then we've got L and R. Some of you might have the metal tabs already inserted. Some of you like me will have to insert them yourselves. I don't think it really matters which way the metal faces. I never think about it. There's just a little slot at the edge on the inside and we can just push that in there as far as you can. Do it to both of them, slots in there nicely. Sometimes they can be a little bit of a pain, but that's fine. And again, we're upside down, so L and R will be on the opposite sides, not sticking them in the shell because they will get in our way. And I'm cutting in here again because I've done something that I normally forget. It's a bit of a meme on the channel. I've got the light pipe. So before you fold this all up together, which you'll see in a second how annoying it could be, you want to take your light pipe and you want to put that in right there. It is always going to be in this top left corner. There's a couple of holes. Some of these are screw posts, but it's the one that's right above this screw post here. There are two notches. You can flip it either way. It does not matter, but you're going to want to stick that in. It's not the end of the world if you do forget it and you don't want to go back in, but it does diffuse the light from the power light a lot better. From here, we're going to look at our Game Boy Advance board, and there is a little number right here. Mine says 32. Yours might say 40. It's going to be either 32 or 40. That means how many pins are on the ribbon connector. And over here, you might be able to see that we have two connectors here. This is the 32 pin. This is the 40 pin. If your number is 40 on your board, you're going to use this one. You'll eventually flip this over and stick the ribbon cable in like this pins up. But if you're like me and you're doing a 32 pin, we're going to take the 40 pin and we're going to fold it over with a light crease, not a hard crease, just in case you ever need it for some reason. I don't know why you would. And then we're going to take the 32 pin and definitely don't hard crease this, but fold it over even lighter of a crease. You don't want to crease at all, but make sure that it wants to go that way a little bit at least. This is the harder version for this. Other kits will have separate ribbon cables, which is nice. But we're also going to take the L and R wires that we've got and stick them up and out through this way, still having one of them go to the left and one of them go to the right, and the L will go to the right, the R will go to the left. Then we're gonna stick our 32 pin over the top of it. We're actually going to loop the select wire underneath it. This is where it's gonna get a little hard to do. We're gonna put our foam on top of all of that, and then we're gonna stick our board down, make sure the wire for select doesn't get anywhere over any of the buttons. And then we can try to put all of this down like so. We can lift up our entire assembly. That'll make it a little easier because the buttons will prevent it from fully going down. Make sure your wires are still sticking through in the same spot as the ribbon cable. But keeping this pinched, now that I have my light pipe installed, we're gonna find our three Phillips screws that are silver and shorter. Some of your kits might have all Phillips screws for the aftermarket ones. Those are typically the cheaper screws. 
So if you have all Phillips screws, even though it might be easier to get into in the future, I recommend reusing your older original screws. But mine are nice and shiny silver, and I've got three small Phillips screws, as well as a black Phillips screw. This is for the outside. The rest of these should be tri-wing screws. I'm gonna take the Phillips, and I'm gonna stick it in those three holes. They are designated by the circles around them on the motherboard, and we're just gonna screw them down. Try not to over tighten it. If you over tighten it, you could break a screw post. That would not be fun. I've done that plenty of times before. And you don't have to do all three, but it's nice. And again, don't over tighten them, but I do like to make them tight ish. And then I back it off about a quarter turn. Backing off all three of them about a quarter turn will ensure that your buttons are easier to press, the membranes won't be as stiff, and your Game Boy will actually sense your button presses better. So now that we've got it all locked down, the rest of this should be a little bit easier to handle. Whether you have a 32 or 40 pin connector, we're gonna take our ribbon cable. It might need to be pulled up a little bit. Don't pull it too far, but have it about this far extended. Then we can fold it back over and stick it in gold pins up. It should look like this. Some of those gold pins will still be sticking up. It won't fully be hidden. Then we can do the reverse of what we did earlier when we undid it. Just close those down at the same time until they're nice and flat. Then your ribbon cable will be locked in. If you're not soldering, then you can pretty much button this up. But for those of us who are soldering and who didn't use the test pads for LNR, this is the way I recommend to do it. For the last time, we can turn on our soldering iron. And no matter which one you're working on, this is not mirrored. It will be the same pin on both sides. We will be soldering to the second pin to the left. That is this one right there, right next to SW2. We are going to heat up that pin, get the solder flowing. We are going to stick our wire in there and lift up. That is pretty much 20 year old solder. So I didn't get the best soldering job. Actually, that's totally acceptable, but if you're struggling, you can put a little bit of flux down. That should help a little bit, and it cleans up that joint a little nicer. I like to wrap the wire around these two capacitors. Your wire might not be long enough. Obviously, don't try and yank it, but it just keeps it a little nicer. Unfortunately, on this side, we don't have anything to really wrap around. But again, we are still soldering to the second pin from the left. It is not mirrored. It is the same. So. We can take our wire, we can heat up that pin, we can stick our wire into the melting solder, and we can lift up. And that was a really good joint. Given a little pull test, we're still good. I didn't give a pull test to the other side, but we're good over there too. For me, I'm done. I can clean my soldering iron tip and put it away. Again, if it's not going right, if you may have accidentally bridged something, use some flux, it'll be helpful. Now, to uh, keep the left wire in check, I like to make sure that the wire is going between these two holes here. We do not want them over either of those because that will make it pinch and short it to ground and then your bar will always be pressed down. So I keep my finger here and then I shove the rest of the wire underneath the cart slot and then that should lock it in right there. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there is space underneath the cart slot. It's not gonna get in the way of your carts, your games, whatever. There is just a gap underneath there for some reason. And again, just make sure there's plenty of space. It's like even between these two holes. Then we can set this down. We can put our power switch in. We can put the right and left side plastic pieces on. That cutout is here on the board, so it'll fit in like a puzzle piece. And then left will go in on the right side because we're upside down and right on the left side. These metal pins go through and then there is a hole for these plastic pins to rest in, so then you get that springy action. It can be a little hard to find the right spot sometimes for this. Again, just don't force it. If it's not going well, you're probably not doing it right. But you can always test the button by holding it down here and seeing if it springs back to life before you close it up. And if it does, you're good. And we're good here. We're almost done. We can take the back half of the shell, we can take off the battery cover, and we can stick it down like so. It can be a little hard to line up your positive and negative battery terminals into the slots on the back half of the shell, but you can line that up and stick it down. 
we can take that black Phillips head screw and we can screw that down. Make sure everything is flat. I like to keep my hand pressured up against this. Then we can swap to our tri-wing bit, still keeping that pressure down because we don't want it to lift up and get misaligned. If we screw it down when it's misaligned, the shell will get cracked and we don't want that. Then I like to do either of these very top two screws for the tri-wing, screw it down a bit, go to the other side, do that one. And I don't like to relieve the pressure from my hand until I get at least one of these bottom ones down. But we're not using like a ton of pressure, so it's really not a big deal if you just leave it there the whole time. And it looks like they included an extra small Phillips screw. That's a motherboard screw, so I'm going to leave that over there. And then we can put the last two screws down in here and over here. And you can make sure all of your screws are tight. Don't over tighten them. You don't want to have a broken screw post, so just don't over tighten it. And if you're having trouble with button presses, it's a little stiff. It feels a little too tight, maybe. You can always back those off like a quarter to a half an inch. Half an inch. You can always back those off a quarter or half a turn, and it should still be fine. Sometimes if these top four screws are too tight, the L and R buttons won't spring back well. Sometimes that's just due to a shell not being the best, or those metal pieces we put in the L and R buttons aren't doing their job properly. From here, we can do pretty much the last step and put our batteries in. Put the battery cover on for good luck, and then we can turn it on. Beautiful. I know it's not really helpful, but the brightness that we turned it on to is the brightness that you will be stuck with if you don't do the soldering. To adjust the brightness, you can press and hold select and press L to lower and R to raise the brightness. There are no other screen options on this kit, but brightness is all I really care about anyways. If you were wanting more features than that, this is not the kit for you. So if you're still trying to decide which kit to go with, check out the IPS comparison video I made a few months ago. And of course, the shell guide is something you'll probably want to check out since IPS ready means nothing these days. There are going to be so many links in the description that I am not looking forward to putting them all there. Again, if you still feel like you need a little more help, check out the extended cut on the second channel. It doesn't have that much more information because I didn't want to leave any important info out of this one, but it might give you the confidence boost you're looking for. Just know, I believe in you. If you somehow still have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. However, I have a section in my Discord server dedicated to helping people with modding. And if all else fails, you can buy this Game Boy or a bunch of others just like it from my website, RetroRemaster.com. I think that's finally it. So like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later, guys. I swear you can do this. Should probably do it on the other side. It just feels better like this, but this is my heart.